<laughs> I'm waiting on you. <laughs> if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. I should say turn back with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 10, starting in verse 1. 1 Corinthians 10 and 1 says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Lord God, I thank you this morning for your love and your benefit. I pray you would bless this service and let it be to, according to your will. In your name, amen. So that's a couple of interesting phrases you won't hear very often. The baptism of Moses and the rock of Christ traveling with the chosen one of Israel. I've, I've glanced at it before and couldn't really find any mention of baptism before John. Uh, the guy, not the book, and not the apostle, other John. Kind of seems to have sprung out of nowhere, but it was already an established practice by the time... John the Baptist rolls up on the scene. Let's just look at what it says here. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. That's uh, complicated and something we may not spend too much time unpacking. But I suppose traveling through the dry lake bed where the Red Sea was a second ago, could be seen as passing through the water, much like an actual baptism. Well, much like a modern baptism, I should say. And I find it noted that they are baptized as followers of Moses, not followers of Christ. Kind of goes against that whole, uh, don't argue with yourselves about if you're followers of Paul or Apollos, we're all baptized in Christ. Well says here the children of Israel were baptized as followers of Moses. So that's not Christians, that's Mosesins. But of course, I digress because the Bible says that Christ traveled with them as their spiritual rock. And I'm not going to discuss this morning, <laughs> you can't make me, um, how Christ is here 2,000 years earlier. Don't worry about it. The point we're trying to make here, the point that Paul is trying to make here, is the sense of unity in the children of Israel. The sense of togetherness. This isn't 12 different tribes fighting and squabbling, theoretically, as they make their way through their great exodus and pilgrimage through the wilderness. This is one unified group. One big old church, as it were. But the Bible does go on to say, Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us, so that we could not crave evil things, oh, so that we would not crave evil things as they did. And kind of this ascending levels of witness for the Christian life. We have here the idea that the children of Israel did the things they did as a witness to the early church. The fact that I am reading about the early church right now means that they did what they did as a witness to us this morning. And of course we do what we do as a witness to future generations not yet born. Verse 7 says, Or worship idols as some of them did. As the scripture says, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality, as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble, as some of them did, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. You know, a lot of this is a lot easier for me than 
the rest of it. You know, don't do pagan rituals, don't go around worshipping snake statues. It's pretty easy. Don't grumble or you get the angel of death. That's a little more complicated. That's a bit harder. Verse 11 says, These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So my dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. And I don't know if that verse counts as reassuring or not, that you will never be tempted beyond what you are capable of standing. Because that obviously should be, on the one hand, a source of great encouragement, that you will always have the strength through Christ to rise to and defeat the challenges you face in your life. On the other hand, that comes with at least a little bit of guilt for each time you fail or fall short, that you are facing a challenge that God said you were capable of handling, and you mucked it up. But that's being human. The real reassuring part here is the idea of no new temptations, or as Ecclesiastes would say, nothing new under the sun. That what you face today are the same problems that generations have faced before you, and overcome, and that God willing, you will be able to do the same. And that's a bit harder of a message to swallow today with all our fancy new gadgets and our new way of life and our culture and our new ideas, our new this, new that, new the other thing. But a lot of that isn't new. It likes to pretend it is, it parades around as being new, but a lot of it is the same old problems and difficulties and arguments humanity has had for a thousand years, and sometimes significantly longer. A lot of the modern takedowns and take that's and problems with the Bible are just echoing what scholars said uh, 1400 years ago to try to disprove the book. They didn't win that argument and they're not going to win this one now. The temptation to cheat people, it's the same temptation to cheat people a thousand years ago. It's just easier now with credit cards and internet doodads and all what not. The temptations of lust and envy and spite and hatred, division, difficulty, bad times, good times, being spoiled, sloth and lazy, and being just desperate and starving and struggling to get by, it has all come before. And if the children of Israel, a great united front, people chosen by God himself and walking with Christ and with a man and leader as great as Moses, if they had the difficulties and problems they had, we should honestly feel pretty good about how we're doing. I don't, I'm not aware of us getting 23,000 people killed in a day any time recently. I missed that church meeting, so um, I think we're doing pretty good. But the, the takeaway here really is the consistency of God. As everything else changes and becomes new or old, as everything else is in a state of flux and upheaval and chaos, our rock, as the Bible says, our Christ, our Lord and Savior, remains the same. And a lot of the times this should be cause for not worry necessarily, but existential dread, especially for those who are not attempting to cultivate a relationship with him because we must remember that our God is the same one as the New Old Testament the book of Leviticus chapter 10 verse 1 Aaron's sons put coals of fire in their incense burners and sprinkled incense over them in this way they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire different than he had commanded so fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up, and they died there before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord meant when he said, I will display my holiness through those who come near me. I will display my glory before all the people. 
And Aaron was silent. And this is a hard passage of scripture. And I will not pretend that it isn't. It goes on to say that Aaron was forbidden from mourning his own sons. That the rest of the tribe were allowed to put on the sackcloth and ashes, but that Aaron and the other direct priests were to carry on and do their job as normal. Because his sons should have known better than to try to offer profane incense. And this is a hard thing for our modern new minds to accept. The idea that God deems it a just and worthy punishment to uh, fireball you if you mess up on worship service. Again, that's a bit of a hard line to toe. That's difficult. Angel of death for being grumpy. But after all, what is the harder thing to understand? The more difficult concept to grasp. Such harsh and strict judgment? Or such unfailing love? Such bottomless forgiveness and compassion as God possesses. The book of Hosea, quickly becoming one of my personal favorites, right up there with the likes of Ecclesiastes. And right towards the end of it, book of Hosea, chapter 14, verse 1. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for your sins have brought you down. Bring your confessions and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and graciously receive us, so that we may offer to you our praises. Assyria cannot save us, nor can our war horses. Never again will we say to the idols we have made, you are our gods. No, in you alone do the orphans find mercy. The Lord says, then I will heal you of your faithlessness. My love will know no bounds. For my anger will be gone forever. I will be to Israel like a refreshing dew from heaven. Israel will blossom like the lily. It will send roots deep into the soil like the cedars in Lebanon. Its branches will spread out like beautiful olive trees, as fragrant as the cedars of Lebanon. My people will again live under my shade. They will flourish like grain and blossom like grapevines. They will be as fragrant as the wines of Lebanon. And this, luckily, saints, we are blessed to understand well, living where we are. I wonder sometimes about the children of Israel when they receive these messages, and God makes it clear to them that they will be like great gardens and bountiful forests and unmatched wheat fields and just the sheer glory of nature. It's a lot easier for me to understand living and driving distance of Northern California you look around at the Middle East and go, Oh, this isn't the world's most impressive gardens. <laughs> and I'm told they had forests back in the day, but still, it's... As a Nevadian, it always humors me to uh, live in such a place as similar to the Middle East as it is and hear messages of the great bountiful milk and honey that supposedly grew out here. And it's just like, eh, are you sure about that? But all kidding aside, what great and blessed promises we have this morning to be who we are and to follow who we do. The unmatched rock of Christ, the only place for orphans to find freedom. Out of all the titles and, <clears throat> and many accolades, great services you can attribute to God. I'm not sure that there is any that I personally like better than the one where orphans find peace. So in conclusion this morning, is there anything else we need to pray about or discuss? I know it's a very short sermon today. I'm tired. You're tired. Let's enjoy some food. Uh, but before we dismiss, is there anything else we need to pray about or discuss? All right. If dear Joshua would pray us out of here and bless the food.